astute young man. And Holmes and I both felt it keenly. My name is Watson, Dr. Watson. And I was privileged to share the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Permit me to consult my notes, and I will tell you what happened in the case of the Three Gables, which began, I think, rather remarkably. I, I don't think any of my adventures with Mr. Sherlock Holmes opened quite so abruptly or so dramatically as that which I associate with the Three Gables. Holmes was in a chatty mood that morning. He just curled down with his pipe in his mouth on the well-worn armchair across the far side from me when our visitor arrived. <laughs> we quite said that a mad bull had arrived to give a clearer impression. What the devil? Which of you two is home? Yes, it is a pleasant morning for the time of year. Oh, it's you, is it? Well, see here. Keep your hands out of other folks' business. Leave folks to manage their own affairs. Got that? You know, I've wanted to meet you for some time. Aren't you Steve Dixie, the bruiser? What if I am? I was just recalling the killing of young Perkins outside the Hoban Bar. Look, I don't have nothing to do with Perkins. I, 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 I was training at a bullring in, in Birmingham when he got done it. Really? Well, all the same, I've got my eye on you, Steve. You and Barney Stockdale. So help me, That's I... That's enough. I can pick you up whenever I want you. Now get out of here. Yeah, there, no, no, there ain't no hard feelings, Mr. Holmes. Nothing personal. There will be unless you tell me who sent you. Well, ain't no secret about that. Stockdale sent me. Him you just mentioned. Then what's it all about? So help me, I don't know. Stevie says, you go and see Mr. Holmes. And tell him his life ain't safe if he goes down her way. That's the truth. Honest. I'll believe you, but no one else would. Now, get out. Sure, Mr. Holmes, sure. I'm going. Morning. Morning, gents. Go. <laughs> A great <laughs> muscular, foolish, blustering baby. Well, you turned him down easily enough. This fellow Barney Stockdale is rather more astute. They belong to the Spencer John gang. Assaults, intimidations and the like. They've taken part in some dirty work lately, which I may clear up when I have the time. But why do they want to intimidate you? It's this Harrow Weald case. Uh, something new to me, Holmes. I was just settling down to tell you about it before we had this comic interlude. <laughs> oh, um, here's a note from the lady concerned, uh, Mrs. Ah, Mabley. Thank you. Uh, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I've had a succession of strange incidents occur to me in connection with this house, and I should much value your advice. You would find me at home any time tomorrow. The house is within a short walk of the Weald Station. I believe that my late husband, Mortimer Mabley, was one of your clients. Yours faithfully, Mary Mabley. Hmm. The Three Gables, Harrow Weald. I wasn't at all sure whether to go. But if it's worth anybody's while to take the trouble to try to stop me, then there must be something in it. Care to come with me? Of course. Excellent. We'll wire her and set off at once. I remember your husband well, madam. Though it's some years since he used my services. Probably you will be more familiar with the name of my son, Douglas, Mr. Holmes. Douglas Mabley? The Douglas Mabley? Dear me, are you the mother of Douglas Mabley? Yes. I knew him slightly, but then all London knew him. What a magnificent figure of a man. Where is he these days, Mrs. Mabley? He's dead. Dead? He was an attaché at our embassy in Rome. He died there of pneumonia last month. Oh, I am sorry, Mrs. Mabley. One cannot connect death with such a man. You remember him as he was. Debonair and splendid. You didn't see the moody, morose, brooding creature into which he developed. In a single month, I seem to see my son turn into a worn-out, cynical man. A love affair? A woman? Or a fiend. But it was... It was not to talk of my poor boy that I asked you to come, Mr. Holmes. Of course. Well, three days ago, I had a call from a man who said he was a house agent. He said that this house would exactly suit a client of his. And that if I would part with it, money would be no object. Strange sort of approach. And that was how it seemed to me, Doctor. Especially since there are several empty houses in the market in this neighborhood which appear to be equally eligible. However, I was interested in what he said. 
I named a price which was 500 pounds more than I gave. Uh-huh. But he closed at once. But he added that his client would wish to buy the furniture as well and asked me to put a price on it. Well, some of this furniture is for my old home and it is, as you see, very good. So I named a good round sum. Very understandable. <laughs> to this, he also agreed. I'd always wanted to travel and the whole bargain was so good that it really seemed that I should be my own mistress for the rest of my life. But there's been a hitch. Yes, yesterday. The man arrived with the agreement all drawn up. Well, luckily, I showed it to Mr. Sutro, who? Uh, my lawyer. Oh, yes. And he said to me, this is a very strange document. Are you aware that if you sign it, you could not legally take anything out of the house? Not even your own private possessions. Good heavens. Yes. So what did you do, Mrs. Mavis? Well, I, when the man came again in the evening, I pointed this out and said that I meant only to sell the furniture. And he said, no, no, it must be everything. Well, naturally, I argued about my clothes, my jewels, and in the end, he agreed to make some concession as to personal effects. But he insisted that nothing must leave the house unchecked. Did he give any reason for this extraordinary demand? Nothing. Beyond saying that his client was a very liberal man, but had certain fads and fancies and his own way of doing things. Evidently. Then uh, what was the outcome? I refused. Much as I was tempted by the money, and I couldn't bring myself to give in to such terms. I... Oh, what is it, Mr. Holmes? Oh, where are you going? It was merely that I wished to ask a question in your presence. Mrs. Mavelin, did you mention to anyone that you were going to write to me and consult me? No, Mr. Holmes, I did not. Who posted your letter? Susan did. Exactly. Now, Susan, to whom did you write or send a message to say that your mistress was asking advice from me? Oh, it's a lie. I sent no message. Now, Susan, queasy people may not live long, you know. It's a wicked thing to tell fibs. Who was it? Susan, I believe you're a bad, treacherous woman. I remember now seeing you speaking to someone over the head. That was my own business. Suppose I tell you it was Barney Stockdale. Well, if you know what you want to ask me for. I wasn't sure, but I know now. Well, now, Susan, it will be worth ten pounds to you if you will tell me who is at the back of Barney. Someone that could lay down a thousand quid for every ten you've got in the world. A rich man, eh? Ah, you smile. A rich woman. Well, uh, now that we've got so far, you might as well give me her name and earn your tenner. Oh, I'm clearing out of here. I've had enough of the lot of you. I'll, I'll send for my box tomorrow. Uh, goodbye, Susan. A paragoric is the stuff of that chest of yours. <sighs> now, Mrs. Mavely, this gang means business. Look how closely they play the game. Your letter to me had the 10 p.m. postmark. Yet Susan passes the word to Barney, Barney goes to his employer, a plan is formed, Big Steve Dixie is called in, and I'm warned off all by 11 o'clock next morning. That's quick work, you know. Yes, I see. But what do they want? Who had this house before you, Mrs. Nabelin? A retired sea captain called Ferguson. Anything remarkable about it? Not to my knowledge. I was wondering whether he'd buried some treasure in the house, Holmes. At first, I thought of some buried valuables. But why, in that case, should they want your furniture? <laughs> you don't happen to have a Raphael or a first folio Shakespeare without knowing it. What I can't understand, Holmes, is why they don't openly say what they do want. Because as I read it, my dear Watson, there's something which Mrs. Nabley doesn't know she has and which she wouldn't give up if she did know. Ah, that's it. Dr. Watson agrees, so that settles it. But what can it... Be, Mr. Holmes. Well, let us see whether we can get it to a finer point by a purely mental analysis. Now, you've been in this house a year, I believe. Nearly two. All the better. During this long period, no one has wanted anything from you. Now, suddenly, within three or four days, you have urgent demands. What would you gather from that? I really don't know. Holmes, it must mean that the object, whatever it may be, has only just come into the house. Bravo, Watson. Uh, has any object, Mr. Rowe? No, I've bought nothing new this year. Indeed? This is very remarkable. 
Uh, is that lawyer of yours a capable man? Oh, Mr. Sutro is most capable. Have you another maid, or was the fair Susan alone? I have a young girl. Then try to get your lawyer, Mr. Sutro, to spend a night or two in the house. You may need protection. Protection? Against whom? Who knows? The matter is certainly obscure. Uh, did this house agent give an address? Uh, only his name. Haynes Johnson. Hmm, I don't think we shall find him in the directory. Honest businessmen don't conceal their place of business. Well, you'll let me know any fresh developments. Yes, no, certainly, Mr. Holmes. You may rely upon it that I shall see your case through. It was very good of you to come. Not at all. I... These trunks and suitcases in the hall. Yes? I see they're labelled from Italy. Yes. They're Douglas's things. You haven't unpacked them? Mm -mm. How long have you had them? They arrived last week. But you said... Why, surely this might be the missing link. How do we know there isn't something of value in there? But there couldn't possibly be. Douglas only had his pay and a small annuity. What could he have of value? Delay no longer, Mrs. Navelli. Have these things taken up to your bedroom. Examine them as soon as possible and see what they contain. I will come tomorrow and hear your report. Well, thank you, Mr. Holmes. I'll do just what you say. Good. Well, thank you, Mrs. Navelli. Good day, madam. Good day, ma'am. Good day, gentlemen. How are you going to find out who's behind it then, Holmes? I think this is a case for Langdale Pike. Langdale Pike? Who's he? Langdale Pike, my dear Watson, is my human book of reference on all matters of social scandal. He spends his waking hours in the bow window of a St. James's Street Club. And he's the receiving station and transmitter of all the gossip of the metropolis. Ah. Yes, this is a case for Langdale Pike. Watson, our ways part here. I have a good many inquiries to pursue, and I probably shan't see you again before morning. Au revoir. I didn't uh, disturb you last night, I hope. No, I never heard a sound. Holmes, Mrs. Hudson's just given this telegram for you. Oh, thank you. A bit early in the morning for that sort of thing, isn't it? Oh, an unpleasant surprise into the bargain. Please come out at once. Client's house burgled in the night. Police in possession, Sutra. I say. There's a great driving power at the back of this business. We must lose no time ourselves. That's our old friend Lestrade. There's no chance for you in this case, I'm afraid. Just a common old garden burglary, well within the capacity of the poor old police. <laughs> no uh, experts need apply. I'm sure the matter is in very good hands, Lestrade. Uh, common burglary, do you say? Oh, not a doubt. We know who they are and where to find them. That Barney Stockdale lot. Steve Dixie and co. They've been hanging around here. Excellent. Uh, what did they get? Oh, nothing much. Chloroformed the lady, though. Oh. Ah, uh, here she is, with her lawyer, Mr. Sutro. Uh, you gave me good advice, Mr. Holmes. Alas, I didn't take it. Well, there's so little to tell. I've no doubt that wicked Susan arranged for them to get in. They must have known the house to an inch. I was conscious for an instant of the chloroform rag being pressed to my mouth, but I've, I've no notion how long I was senseless. When I woke, one man was at the bedside, and another was removing something from my son's baggage, which I had taken up to my room, as you suggested. I sprang up and seized this man. You took a big risk, ma'am. I clung to him, but he shook me off, and the other one must have struck me. I can remember no more. Evidently, my little maid, Mary, heard the noise and began screaming out of the window, and that brought the police. But the rascals had got away. What did they take? That's what I want to know. I can't tell you. I'm sure there was nothing of value in my son's trunks, and nothing else is missing. Any clues, Lestrade? This sheet of paper. The fellow may have dropped it when Mrs. Mabley tackled him. Yes, it's in my son's handwriting. What do you make of this paper? Well, looks like something he was trying to write. You know, a novel or something. In fact, it may be the end of this novel, mayn't it? Hmm? You've noticed the number at the top of the page, 245. I uh, had noticed that. 
Yes. And no doubt you asked yourself where the odd 244 pages have got to. Does it suggest anything to you, Inspector? Yes, it suggests that in their hurry they just grabbed at what came first to hand. But why should they go to my son's things, Inspector? Well, ma'am, they found nothing valuable down below, so they found their luck upstairs. That's how I read it. Mr. Holmes, what... Um, I must think it over. Uh, Watson, mm -hmm. will you come over here, please? Certainly. What is it, Holmes? Read this fragment of the novel, or whatever it is. Oh, very well. Face bled considerably from the cuts and blows, but it was nothing to the bleeding of his heart as he saw that lovely face, the face for which he had been prepared to sacrifice his very life, looking out at his agony and humiliation. She smiled. Yes, by heaven, she smiled. Like the heartless fiend she is, as he looked up at her. It was at that moment that love died and hate was born. Man must live for something. If it is not for your embrace, my lady, then it shall be for your undoing and my complete revenge. <laughs> I wouldn't commit burglary for that. But did you notice the grammar? Huh? Instead of the heartless fiend she was, it suddenly changed to is, and he to my. Oh, yes, yes, you're right, Holmes, as though... As though he got so carried away by what he was writing that it seemed as if he was mixed up in it himself. Precisely. The Lestrade is welcome to have this back. Well, find anything in it, Mr. Holmes? Oh, here you are, Lestrade. No, I don't think there's anything more for me to do. Now, the case is in your capable hands. Oh, thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, Mrs. Mabelin, yes. did you say you wished uh, to travel? Oh, if I had the money, I, I should go round the world. Round the world? Quite so. Well, uh, good morning. I may drop you a line in the evening. Come, Watson. Now, Watson, we're on the last lap of our little journey. Well, I hope you're not going to drop me off and tell me you'll see me in 24 hours, that's all. If you're near to a solution, I want to be in on it. My dear fellow, I shouldn't dream of abandoning you. In any case, I shall feel safer with a witness. <laughs> it's always advisable in dealing with such ladies as Isadora Klein. Is it? Who? Though the name Isadora Klein conveyed nothing to you. No. She was, of course, the celebrated beauty. There was never a woman to touch her. You don't She married the old German sugar king, Klein, and presently found herself the richest as well as the loveliest widow on earth. She had several lovers... And Douglas Mabley, one of the most striking men in London, was one of them. Well, from all I ever heard of Mabley, he was anything but a social butterfly. True. He was a strong, proud man who gave and expected all. Their association was no mere adventure to him. But she, as the belle dame sans merci of fiction, when her caprice is satisfied, the matter is ended, and if the other party can't take her word for it, she knows how to bring it home to him. Well, then, then that, that, that was his own story he was writing. Ah, you're piecing it together. Uh, I hear also, from my friend Langdale Pike, who supplied all the rest, that Isadora Klein is now about to marry the young Duke of Lomond, who might almost be her son. His grace's mother might overlook the age question, but a big scandal would be a different matter. Ah, here we are, at Madame Klein's house. like to know the meaning of this intrusion, gentlemen. I need not explain, madam. I have too much respect for your intelligence to do so. Though I fancy that intelligence has been surprisingly at fault of late. How so, sir? In supposing that your hard bullies could frighten me off. I do not know what you are talking about. What have I to do with hired bullies? I seem to have overrated your intelligence, madam. Good afternoon. Come on. Sir, where are you going? To Scotland Yard. Come, come and sit down, gentlemen. Let us talk this matter over. Oh, very well. I feel that I may be frank with you, Mr. Holmes. You have the feelings of a gentleman. Mm, how quick a woman's instinct is to find it out. I will treat you as a friend. I cannot promise to reciprocate, madam. I am not the law, but I represent justice so far as my evil powers go. I'm ready to listen, and then I will tell you how I will act. No doubt it was foolish of me to threaten a brave man like yourself. What was really foolish, madam, is that you placed yourself in the power of rascals who may blackmail you or give you away. No, no. I am not so simple. 
No one, save Barney Stockdale and Suzanne, his wife... Mrs. Mabel is maid? Uh, the same. Uh-huh. No one except Stockdale and Suzanne knows who their employer is. They are good hounds who run silent. Such hounds have a way sooner or later of biting the hand that feeds them. They'll be arrested for the burglary, you know. The police are already after them. They will take what comes to them without saying more. That is what they are paid for. I shall not appear in the matter. Unless I bring you into it. Ah, but you would not. You are a gentleman. It is a woman's secret. You must give back that stolen manuscript. <laughs> See, see here. In the fire? What? It's full of paper ash. Shall I give that back? Shall I, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? You've sealed your fate, madam. You've gone too far this time. How hard you are. Let me tell you the whole story. I fancy I could tell it to you. But you must look at it with my eyes, Mr. Holmes. You must understand it from the point of view of a woman who sees all her life's ambition about to be ruined at the last moment. Is such a woman to be blamed if she protects herself? The original sin was yours. That I admit. He was a dear boy, Douglas. But he did not fit into my plans. He wanted marriage. Marriage for me, Mr. Holmes. With a penniless commoner. (laughs) But no. Nothing less would serve him. And then... Then he became pertinacious. Because I had given... He seems to think that I still must give unto him only. Oh, it was intolerable. At last, I had to make him realize it. By hiring ruffians to beat him under your window. Mm, You do indeed seem to know everything. Well, it's true, Barney and the boys drove him away and were, I admit, a little rough in doing so. But what did he do then? Could I have believed that a gentleman would do such an act? What did he do? He wrote a book. Oh. He wrote it to tell his own story. I, of course, was the wolf and he the lamb. It was all there, under different names, of course. But who in London would have failed to recognize it? What do you say to that, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? He was within his rights. It was as if the air of Italy had got into his blood and brought with it the old, cruel Italian spirit. He wrote to me and sent a copy of his book so that I might have the torture of anticipation. There were two copies, he said. One for me, one for his publisher. I knew who his publisher was. I found out that no manuscript had reached him from Italy. Then came Douglas's sudden death. I knew that the manuscript must still be amongst his belongings, and that so long as it existed, there could be no safety for me. So you had to steal it from his mother's house. What else could I do, Mr. Holmes? A woman with a scandal hanging over her and her whole future at stake. Well, well. I suppose I shall have to compound a felony as usual. Mr. Holmes? Tell me, madam, how much does it cost to go round the world? A first class, of course. Round the world? I do not understand. Could it be done on 5,000 pounds? Well, yes. Oh, I, I should think so, certainly. Very good. Then I think you will sign me a check for that amount, and I will see that it reaches Mrs. Mabley. After all the distress she has suffered, you owe her a little change of air. I, I, but I, you I, broke I, her son's heart. God knows I am sorry for that. Very well. I will pay her. And, madam. Yes. Have a care. Have a care. Even a woman as beautiful as you cannot play with edged tools forever without cutting those dainty hands.